And you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. Welcome back to another episode of Researchers on a Mission. That's right, Researchers, plural, R O A M Radio. I am your host, Dr. J, with my co host, live in London, Johnny Webb. And of course, we have another fascinating show with, for you today with a very, very special guest. And we are speaking on something that will change the world essentially with this book that you will hear about that is actually circulating among the Department of Defense and other politicians and high-ranking generals as a way to change our wars. As a matter of fact, our good friend, uh, the Honorable Paul Heller, who you just recently heard and, and will be back again, is actually reading this as we speak. And with that being said, let's go ahead and introduce our very special guest, and that is Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Michael Aquino, PhD. Dr. Aquino, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here, Dr. Jake. It is an absolute pleasure to have you on. And of course, the war that the, the book that we were talking about is Mind War. But before we get into a description of that and then go through the phases and, and the implications of that, I was hoping that you can first give everybody a background. But before you, you do that, let's go ahead and, and say why there might be some background noise uh, where you're at right now. Well, as it happens, uh, President Barack Obama is having dinner next door here tonight. There is a Democratic uh, Party fundraiser at $33,000 a plate. So the entire block has been cleared of cars. There are helicopters flying overhead. There are handsome little Secret Service fellows standing all over the place in black suits and earpieces and police cars all over the place. And if you hear a, a certain amount of ruckus and sirens at some point, then that will be the president showing up in his convoy to stop and have some dinner next door. <laughs> his motorcade. Yeah. Well, hey, that would be amazing if it happens while we're interviewing you because the listeners can actually get a little peep of what they probably don't hear necessarily too often. I've seen the motorcade pass by here in Los Angeles, and it is a ruckus, not just because of what it makes, but because of all the darn streets that close for him each time. Um, uh, anyway, that's beyond the subject. Let's go into your background because you have such a fascinating background. I was going to ask you this, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Uh, you are a fellow gaucho. I went, studied my undergrad at University of California, Santa Barbara, as did you, and you earned your PhD. So let's go from there, what you earned, and then into your military career. All right. Well, I graduated from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 1968 with a bachelor's degree in political science and at the same time was what the Army designates as a distinguished military graduate of the ROTC program, which puts you on a, the same level as a West Point graduate based on your class standing and performance. So I was commissioned in the regular army at that time as an armor officer and uh, spent my uh, first couple of years in the 82nd Airborne Division and then at the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center at uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, before being assigned to Vietnam. Uh, let me throw in there that 82nd Airborne, which makes you a parachutist, and I, I've people know out there that I am a skydiver, so we have that in common as well. I thought that was really amazing. How many jumps do you have? Oh, gee, I've lost count at this point. The only one that I really remember specifically was the first one. <laughs> <laughs> we all remember that one, that's for sure. Would you say uh, under or over 100? Oh, under 100, but I would say probably easily over oh, 30 or 40 anyway. Ah, a well-accomplished skydiver here uh, in, in uh, uh, the NAT USPA, United States Parachute Association, requires an eight-level course called Accelerated Free Fall. Not that it makes your free fall any faster. They just want to accelerate you through the free fall school. Point okay. being, 30, 40 jumps, you've already earned a, an A license, which would make you uh, eligible to jump your own chute, uh, jump your your pack your own and do group jumps. I think that's fascinating. And uh, maybe one day if you get back into it, we could go in the sky. Let's go pick up 
actually we're, we're back to your military career before we get in your book. One thing that I love in your biography, and this leads right into your book, is that you said you graduated from the School of Warfare, the PSYOPs division. You were an active participant in the PSYOPs warfare as well as MK Ultra. And I know that's a very controversial subject. Some people believe it was terminated. Others think it, it was terminated publicly, but still continues to this day. Maybe you can dispel that myth, but let's can you tell the, the listeners about your work in MK Ultra? Well, um, I'm going to actually have to correct you a little bit there because uh, I was never actually involved in MK Ultra, which, as far as I understand, closed down as an active program about the time that I was in high school. Now, there were successor programs which attempted, and I'll get into this a little bit more when we discuss the Mind War book, that attempted to control people's conscious thoughts, which was what MKUltra was trying to do in the post-World War II era. But all of these were extremely flawed, and if you know anything about the physiology of human thought and the brain, were sort of doomed to failure, which I could have told them about at the time. But what, uh, what I was involved with, which you are correct about, is U.S. Army PSYOP and PSYOP in the rest of the government. Now, by PSYOP, we mean psychological operations, which has to do with not just propaganda, but all means by which you attempt to speak with the enemy or with neutral populations to influence their beliefs and behavior. And this was originally when I was uh, went through the training in the late 1960s at Fort Bragg, a fairly basic kind of propaganda uh, education. This is things like battlefield loudspeakers and leaflets and posters and newspapers and radio communications and that sort of thing. And that's what we were using, for example, in Southeast Asia, which is where I then went uh, when I was assigned to the 4th Psychological Operations Group headquartered in Saigon and basically controlling PSYOP for the whole Southeast Asian uh, area there. So I had not only the school education of it at Fort Bragg, which is the uh, John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center there, but then over a year or so of it uh, actually in the field in Southeast Asia, seeing what worked and what didn't. And that was where I also, of course, got a very first-hand look at what, uh, what I call physical or hot warfare uh, is all about, which gave me, quite frankly, a very lasting loathing for that kind of thing and strengthened my resolve to see what I could do to come up with something better as far as the uh, ways in which human beings go about solving their problems. And that's what would ultimately lead me to the Mind War Project. And that's exactly where we're getting. Let me throw one quick comment. I was talking to a, a listener friend, and I told him what we were going to interview. He saw your book, very fascinated, wanted to buy it. And I told him about your background at the JFK School of Warfare in the PSYOPs division. And he didn't believe me. He, he said, there's no such thing. And I actually showed him the biography, and, and he was like, oh, well, I don't know if it's true. And I made him Google it online, and sure enough, he found it. So I just wanted to dispel the myth that, yes, there is a psychological operations warfare department in the JFK School uh, of Warfare and I just uh, wanted to make that known because obviously it does exist and to this day we are absolutely in it. Now let's go into Mind War and, and of course there are some fascinating quotes and as we get through each uh, area two off the top of my hand which we discussed off air if you could uh, mention when, when it's appropriate and then if, if you think of any other ones by all means go for it but I, again since I read the book, the the listeners haven't. Let's let's tell them about it first. Let's give the premise, and then let's go uh, through the book. All right. Let me just preface this by going into a couple of more background things here. First, when I was originally commissioned in the army, as I mentioned, it was an armor branch, but I spent so much time in the special operations field, which is what is the nerve center, you might say, there at Fort Bragg in the John F. Kennedy Center, that I eventually transferred first into the civil affairs branch and then into military intelligence, where I spent the rest of my active career. I am actually retired in the branch of psychological operations, which was sort of a courtesy extended to me since they created this branch of psychological operations on exactly the same day that I retired from the Army. 
And before then, it was what was called, like special forces, a branch immaterial specialty, among other things, because the government and the army was quite nervous about giving it too much visibility. It sounds, as one general said to me, indeed, he was a four-star general and the vice chief of staff of the army. When I asked him at one point about uh, how come we don't have a PSYOP branch, he said, well, the United States does not do propaganda or psychological operations. Other people do that. Uh, so we need what you do. We just can't talk about it. <laughs> so this was one of those very gray area specialties in the Army, which has a very interesting and very colorful and uh, also very essential history. But it is not very well known to people, which is why your friend who uh, didn't know about it uh, is not that unusual. It, all these special operations fields, which are special forces, that's the Green Berets, civil affairs, and psychological operations are all part of the John F. Kennedy Center for Special Warfare headquartered at Fort Bragg. And I'm one of those relatively rare officers who's actually been through all of these qualification fields, not just one or two of them. One thing I, I want to mention as we go throughout the book is, of course, the abbreviations uh, MW or, or Mind War and then Physical Warfare, a uh, Fizz War. Now, people may know this or may not know this, but since we invaded Afghanistan after uh, 9-11 and then, of course, the Iraq invasion in 2003, to date, we have spent six trillion dollars on that war alone six trillion dollars and yet if we ended up using our resources just as jfk said in in right before he was assassinated which basically wanted to end not only nuclear armament but to end a warfare in general and, and he basically wanted the the world's if you recall this the speech to stop uh, arming themselves as with armies and just keep a small uh, I don't want to say the word militia but to keep a small army just to keep peace within the, their own countries I think that's what might have gotten killed We I don't know, it's only speculation but he obviously at the time was very uh, a, a big advocate to end phys war, physical warfare and I think that was a, a very very good premise and, and therefore the fact that you went to his school of warfare psychological operations division psyops I think is extremely important since he was probably someone that advocated it. Now let's talk about the cost of physical warfare and phys war and what we can save as a nation and as all nations uh, the Canada, the UK, all the Western countries, and indeed every country on this globe, if we stop using fizz war. Well, let me, um, let me. I think this is probably a good point, if uh, if I may, to just sort of quickly give people an overview of what this concept of mind war is. Um, and again, just briefly before I go into that, um, I might mention that. In the mid-1980s, when I was, again, temporarily off active duty, I went back to our alma mater of UCSB and did my master's and doctorate there also in political science and international relations. So that's where my doctorate came from. And in the also in the 1980s, I spent about six years as an adjunct professor of political science uh, teaching it at Golden Gate University in San Francisco. So... I have a pretty good seasoning on the academic side of this, and I'm also a 1987 graduate of the highest level of education professionally in the Defense Department, the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. So I have, you might say, been around the block in political military affairs here. And indeed, my primary specialty designator in my military career as a senior officer was actually a, an extremely rare one called Political Military Affairs Officer, or 48 Gulf Primary Specialty Code, which is about as rare as the 00 series in Ian Fleming's novels. <laughs> you, are a, you are supposed to be a personal problem-solving expert in all sorts of political issues and military issues worldwide. So I spent, at that point, most of my time as a specialist with NATO. In any case, let me go into the mind war concept here and give your listeners a sort of a, a quick and dirty 
summary of what this is all about. So let's understand that mankind, of course, has been plagued by warfare since antiquity, and by the 21st century it has become not only a constant and worldwide issue, but also extremely efficient and lethal. The usual counter-effort, which is pressure for peace, is also very temporary and very transient. So what we have here is a very dangerous situation, much more so in the 19th or early 20th centuries, where what I call fizz war for short, or physical war, has become a luxury that we simply can't afford. It is too terrible, too expensive, and increasingly dangerous. Take, for example, the fact that we are now uh, playing a game of who's is bigger with uh, Russia over the Ukraine. Well, Russia happens to have a complete functional arsenal of nuclear intercontinental ballistic missiles, and so do we. Now, I don't think that rational people on either side are thinking of lighting a candle to these, but all it takes is somebody to make a mistake and the world goes up. And believe me, in our history, both on the classified and unclassified sides, at times like the Cuban Missile Crisis, we have had more than a few instances where we came very close to lighting that candle. So we may think that this is something of an intellectual exercise, but actually we're in a high state of danger worldwide. And in the meantime, a terrible amount of injury of people worldwide, where we've become sort of numbed to a condition of permanent warfare, almost like George Orwell uh, discussed in 1984. So what is mind war? Well, mind war is uh, a different kind of solution, which is the preemption and replacement of conventional fizz war by something more powerful and effective in solving these problems. And it's based on the principle that fizz war is an emotional uh, blind reaction to the breakdown of reason dialogue. So when you have, for example, um, a diplomatic back and forth, like you see right now with Angela Merkel and uh, the other people involved in the Ukraine situation, there is a diplomatic dialogue, but if it breaks down, if people lose patience and get emotional or get too angry, then things just simply collapse into fizz war or physical war. An excellent historic example of what happens then is the United States Civil War. There was a lot of discussion back and forth, negotiations before 1860, but once war was declared, all those all that uh, attempt at reasoning just simply stopped. And it was five years of just slaughter. Well, that was pretty horrible then, but these wars are much more horrible now. And you yourself, Dr. J, made reference to what we've just seen, uh, these years of war in Afghanistan and Iraq. And what have they accomplished? Have they solved Nothing. the problems? No, they haven't. Things are, are more desperate, angrier. We have more enemies. Uh, we are now facing this extreme reaction in this Islamic, Islamic State situation. ISIS, uh, you mean? You know, so, so you do not see any movement really in the direction of a reasoned solution. You see congressmen and senators who are calling for more violence, more warfare, and so on. So... What mind war does, it's a mechanism for taking a given crisis situation back to the thought processes of the individual and collective human minds involved and adjusting these correctively and positively at that level. So what we're trying to do is not so much change uh, superficial opinions and agendas. We're trying to change the underlying climate of the thought involved here. And the reason that this is key, and the reason that mind war is so much different from things like MK Ultra and so on that you brought up earlier, is that what people don't understand in the architecture of human thought is that only about 5% of our thinking takes place at the conscious level. But what uh, we refer to in thought architecture as 
the liminal level. The other 95% is what is called pattern thinking, and it takes place at the subconscious or the subliminal level. And to make this a little clearer, your pattern thinking, your pattern thoughts, your subconscious uh, thinking is what essentially governs how you perceive reality and how you perceive morality. This is the instinctive sort of basis that you have for deciding whether a particular situation is good or bad or the people involved in it are good or, are good or bad. What takes place at the top level, the, the argumentative uh, thinking or the algorithmic reasoning there, is simply a very transitory dialogue, but it doesn't change your underlying perceptions of what should be real and what should be good. And what MK Ultra did, and some of its other follow-ups and predecessors, it tried to control people at that liminal level by the use of things like chemicals and stress devices and so on. And because that isn't where you actually make your decisions concerning reality and morality, it was a failure. It did not touch and didn't even know about the subconscious realm, which is where these things actually take place. All of what mind war consists of, which detail in the book under the heading of psychons or psy controls, PSY controls, are mechanisms that address the machinery in your thought processes and your body by which your subconscious realities are determined. So you don't even know that a mind war campaign may be underway uh, targeting you because all this takes place at the subconscious level. However, the net result of it in, a, in an ideal mind war campaign is to make everybody positive and friendly and cooperative. And what we do is to take the two sides, the two antagonistic human sides of the conflict, and actually transform them both into one side, and we take the issue itself, the thing that is irking them, and turn that into the enemy, if you need an enemy. So you still have a war, you still have one side and the other side, but all the humans are on one side, and the problem is on the other. And that is the initial mechanism of the way mind war functions. I hope that isn't too abstract. And I'll take a breather here in case you want to get a word in edgewise. Yes, actually, I, I want to throw in a couple things. And then I know Johnny has a question. Uh, I'll ask you about the implementation after his. But first, I want to comment on a few things. Going back earlier to what you said about us being very close, of course, to, to annihilation. We had the Cuban Missile Crisis, and as everyone knows, what we dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki are nowhere near the, uh, as explosive and damaging as the hydrogen bombs of the 50s, just nowhere near the devastation that would result. I know of two other incidents that are recorded in history, one of them being where the Russians... Uh, mistook a flock of birds as jets and they were literally minutes away uh, they already had set their their launch codes for their missile silos to to take off and they were literally minutes away from going until they got the call from khrushchev saying uh, uh, no there's nothing launched from from the u.s because he spoke to the president i you know of another incident where there was uh, this actually caused nixon and and i i don't know if it was if khrushchev was still in power then it was nixon it might have been a, a president prior to him where uh, there was unidentified flying objects they they don't know obviously what they were and the u.s thought that they were from Russia. The Russia, the Soviet Union thought they were from the U.S. This was in the 60s. Uh, so obviously it wasn't uh, Nixon, but it was implemented after that. And what happened was, is we came this close to another nuclear war that nobody knew about until it was declassified 30, 40 years later. And what that caused it to do was to create a red phone line directly from the President of the United States to Khrushchev to literally dispel uh, saying that we did not launch a preemptive attack so we don't get hit by a nuclear missile 
uh, you know, from an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile, because of a mistake. And you're absolutely right. We came close to it so many times. I think this would be also, let me throw in this, that me and, and Johnny also interviewed uh, an amazing fellow. His name is Shannon Panzo. He started a course called Zox Pro based on uh, Richard Welch's findings from 1975 on subliminal photography, subliminal messaging, and essentially mental photography, which is not... Um, it's not necessarily the, the, what people think. It's not that you look at something and you photograph it, but you, you would know about this. The reason people remember something from two years old and can't remember anything for 10 years later, but when they remember what they were to is they'll remember the setting, the color of the wall, the smell, every word that was spoken is because that's in their subconscious and their conscious mind links to it r- r- openly. You are completely correct. This is, this is, again, an example of pattern thinking, which takes these pictures that you have of reality so that when, for example, you walk out your front door and you see the street out in front of you, you see the street lights, you see people around you, this is a, a pattern in your thinking that you understand and expect to be the reality out there. And you know how to react to people, you know how to react to changing colors and street lights, and none of this re- really requires you to think about it. It's all at that subliminal level. But these are all patterns that are developed over the years, and some of them, as I said, are developed um, what you might say by by social exposure, by parents teaching you and communities teaching you and so on. But a number of these uh, are products of the electromagnetic spectrum and aspects of it, including... Um, the visual symbols and color symbols and brain waves and even things like electromagnetism that are acting on your body and on your brain without you really being uh, consciously aware of it. People do not understand, and it's actually a very simple proposition if you think about it. Your mind and your body are a large electrochemical machine. That's how it functions. I mean, it has a lot of water in it, <laughs> things like yes. that. But you are a device that is governed by and subject to the electromagnetic spectrum. And if you ever take a look at the electromagnetic spectrum on the Internet, you'll see that there are only very small pieces of it that your five senses pick up that you're aware of. But the rest of it is acting on you all the time. And that's what Mind War gets into, all the rest of those inputs and expressions. And interestingly enough, you know, you mentioned just a couple of months ago some close calls and another one that occurred to me during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Did you know that the United States dropped depth charges on a Soviet submarine uh, that was too close to our quarantine line that happened, and we did not know this at the time, happened to have nuclear missiles on it? I had no idea. And the, the submarine uh, suffered a good deal of damage. And under his standing orders, the Soviet captain actually had launch uh, uh, instructions under a situation like that. But at the last minute, that Soviet captain decided that he wasn't going to be the first one to push a button. So instead of firing that nuclear missile, which would have started World War III right then, um, he simply didn't. And he took this injured submarine back, you know, out of the... Uh, danger area and we survived that one and nobody knew about this for years and years and years it's one of the things that Oliver Stone just brought out during his uh, recent PBS series and uh, one more thing that uh, makes you breathe a sort of a retroactive sigh of relief that we've had so many of these close calls and that's why I think Mind War is timely and important because How often are we going to go on and play Russian roulette here, if you'll pardon the pun, you know, uh, because it isn't just the Russians, it's us too, um, until somebody pushes the wrong button and we all go up, so to speak. Well, I don't want that to happen. I don't think you or Johnny do. So this is my effort to see if we can come up with uh, something better to solve human problems with. 
And I absolutely do remember you telling about that incident. And as I was saying, I had no idea up until that. And I am very grateful for that submarine captain to make <laughs> that sure conscious decision. That's right, because uh, the, what he not only would World War Three would have started, the annihilation that would have happened on the continental United States would have been unfathomable. The amount, the millions of people that would have died directly uh, from the the blast as well as the nuclear fallout just is we just can't even imagine the damage but exactly you're 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 right we are very grateful that happened uh johnny go ahead and ask your question hi there doctor um aquino i have to get it right because it's not a familiar name to me but good evening to you yeah, the, the, a couple of questions i'd like to go back you said you you, you started off under the light special forces before it became the psyops branch and um i, I was wondering with with the techniques that were used were there holographic usage at all before you, you know, you became, uh, you know, out of the system of, of psyops? Um, I'm not. Uh, uh, could you re- repeat that, please? I'm not sure I caught the question. Well, I understood that before psyops branch, it was called special forces, and that you were part of that. And then, oh, I before the spot, the special forces started. My question was, is whilst you were under that, w- were there ever usages of uh, holographic materials? Um, well, first of all, er- originally both psychological operations, or PSYOP, and special forces, which are the Green Berets, a little bit comparable to uh, Britain's SAS, those were both what were called branch immaterial specialties in the Army, meaning that they didn't raise them to the level of formal branches. So you could be a member of some other branch and then be temporarily assigned to one of these branch immaterial things. Civil affairs, uh, which people will remember uh, from World War II as things like military government, that did have its own branch. Civil affairs was a branch, but special forces and PSYOP were branch immaterial specialties. Yes. And intelligence officer before I qualified in both these, and then I was assigned to um, different responsibilities and positions in those two branch immaterial areas. Now today, Special Forces and PSYOP have both been raised to the level of formal branches. So you will see them today if you look for them on the Internet as branches. But back then, uh, up through the ni- early 1990s, they were branch and material specialties. Now, when you John. refer to a holograph, um, I'm not quite sure what you mean there. Um, uh, well, what, what I meant from that was the fact that the Disclosure Project, you know, discusses that the, the possibility of a future psyops would be a holographic event, which would use holographs to portray possibly aliens, UFOs, and that would sort of divert the public sway of, you know, internal war against a, you know, an incoming war from, from you know, outside forces. And oh, I see. I think what you mean, yes. Uh, in other words, the use of things like holograms to create three-dimensional images of, of real things, uh, supposedly like flying saucers and so on, that kind of thing. Well... Yeah, but but also obviously with the ufology, you know, understanding of people that that are looking into these things that, that have come out through Disclosure Project, you know, they do talk about a phenomenon um, whereby uh, this this type of psyops would be used to uh, to to sway the masses. And I just wondered if you had any understanding of that at all. Well, we've never we've never done anything like that uh, targeting domestic populations here, although I am familiar with uh, a number of techniques in which you can use triangulated holography uh, through lasers to create images. And yes, that kind of deception operation is very much in the forefront of things, but we haven't we haven't used it as, uh, in my experience, to target, for example, domestic populations in things like ufology. Now, deception operations mean that, of course, you can create any kind of a visual image, like an aircraft or even a ship, by this kind of triangulation, and that can be very useful if you want to create uh, phantom uh, aircraft or ship fleets. Um, 
And it goes right along with the current advances in information warfare, where you're creating electronic signals that mimic that mimic actual groups of mechanisms or planes or ships or things like that. So this this entire area of this artificial deception creation is a very real one and a very active one. I have not I have not personally been involved with it uh, to the point where. I would say that I've I've used this in in my time because again I retired in 2006 from the army and it's only now that this stuff is really coming into its own but believe me you're going to see a lot of it in the next few years because there's a enormous amount of research going into this kind of thing. One one comment on that and then I want to ask you about the implementation of mind warp. Uh, going back to deception during World War II uh, Normandy invasion, we misled Hitler by using uh, magicians to uh, to create uh, that we had an army standing army of the allied forces on another uh, beach in France and we used a blow up uh, literally balloons of tanks and jeeps and and st- statues uh, of men that literally from the surveillance that Hitler had believed that that's where the invasion was going to take place. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there because you're absolutely speaking about that. But let's go uh, into the implementation of Mind War because I think it's extremely important since it will save uh, trillions of dollars as well as countless lives which nowadays one one last comment i want to make that me and you spoke of off air uh, maybe weeks ago or a few months ago on this topic is that warfare now is very different because then in, in world war one world war two and all the old wars it was it was close up very ugly battle but now you have an 18 year old kid fresh out of high school literally in nellis air force range sitting in in a bunker and all he is doing is playing a video game with a drone and he's he's operating something halfway around the world and it's dropping bombs and killing a bunch of people yet uh, he's not seeing this And, and i think that takes away the horror and that's sad because he's not seeing the brains of these children that are there or the limbs and and all this terrible terrible uh, savagery that comes from warfare and i think that dumbing down and desensitizing of the warfare is is a major point but let's go into the actual implementation uh you broke it down in your book in different phases of what the world governments would do uh, and i also think this would be a proper time for you to use uh, two of the most fascinating quotes of course there's so many just two that are off the top of my head as as a premise before we go into those uh, phases all right well i think the the first one that you have in mind was actually spoken by Reichs Marshal Hermann Goering and took place during the Nuremberg trials after World War II. And um, he was, of course, uh, having his feet held to the fire about the hysteria in, in Germany that led to war fever there. And Goering was um, a very pragmatic person and a <laughs> real pretty cynical one, too. And he, he said this quote, which has been re uttered many times. Naturally, the common people don't want war, neither in Russia, nor in England, nor for that matter in Germany. But after all, it is the leader of the country who determines the policy, and it is always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it is a democracy or a fascist dictatorship or a parliament or a communist dictatorship, uh, voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. Uh, And then, uh, excuse me here while I turn the page, and he went on to say, that is easy. All you have to do is tell them that uh, they are being attacked and then denounce the peacemakers for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same in any country. 
a fascinating quote by him. Uh, yes, he might have been twisted by working for Hitler, but obviously he made a very, very good point in the Nuremberg trials. Uh, he was an intelligent man, whether we we agree with what he did. I, obviously, we don't, uh, you know, ki- killing massive people in, in, in uh, gas chambers, but... Again, the thought process of, of these individuals, you have to take into account and at least appreciate them. Uh, what was the other quote? This uh, actually came from John Fowles, very intelligent uh, British novelist. And uh, it came from his novel, The Magus, uh, when he was, when conscious, one of his characters therein was discussing the concept of war after his own experiences in World War One. And I was rather fascinated by this, so I included it in the Mind War book, and it is this. Men love war because it allows them to look serious, because they imagine that it is the one thing that stops women laughing at them. In it, they can reduce women to the status of objects. That is the great distinction between the sexes. Men see objects, women see the relationship between objects whether the objects need each other, uh, love each other, match each other, but it is an extra dimension of feeling that we men are without, and one that makes war abhorrent to all real women, and absurd. I will tell you what war is. War is a psychosis caused by an inability to see relationships our relationship with our fellow men, our relationship with our economic and historic situation, and above all, our relationship to nothingness, to death. Think of extremely fascinating quote, and both of them. And one thing I really loved about your book is that the level of intelligent quotes that you have in there uh, on top of this implement- implementation of mind war, which I think is an extremely important topic that I'm very, very happy to know is circulating among the Department of Defense. Now, uh, let's go into the actual phases of implementation of mind war and ending fizz war? Well, um, this actually takes me back to some of my doctoral research because I was very much involved at the time in the field of political forecasting. And political forecasting, of course, takes you into an international situation or a national one and looks at all the factors that are driving a country or a group of countries in a particular direction. These are economic factors, political factors, whether you have certain uh, charismatic actors or you have certain needs or desperations in a country, you have population pressures, perhaps uh, food pressures, movements of populations. And I became involved in a number of think tanks, such as the Hudson, Hudson Institute here in the United States, and also the Club of Rome, which was an international one at the time in the 60s, which looked at various international factors and tried to come up with pictures of how emerging world situations would take place. So today when we look at a, an area of the world, what we really should be doing is not waiting for something to blow up in our face, like has happened in the last couple of decades here in the Mideast, we should be looking at these areas of the world with foresight, not with aft sight. And we should be saying, you know what? I see this factor and this factor and this factor, and they are coming together in the wrong ways. And if we don't adjust these things now, they are going to combust. So that is really the very first step and probably the most essential one in a mind war campaign, which is that you don't wait for something to explode in your face. You take a given area of the world or a given country or a given society or a given given geographic area or a given economic situation, such as, say, the, the international price of petroleum or something like this, and you advance game this to see where it's going. If there is something that is headed towards a problem or a confrontation, then you adjust it beforehand cooperatively 
before it becomes something at which uh, makes people stand up on their hind legs and start yelling at each other about. So that's what you might call the most important phase of mind war. A lot of the rest of it has to do with with catch up. In other words, this book, if you implemented this mind war book right now, you'd be walking into a large number of cesspools around the planet that have already gone beyond this stage. If you look at the Mideast, for example, right now, it's a mess, and everybody hates everybody else. And people are so angry because they've had members of their communities and families and wiped out and their homes destroyed and their livelihood destroyed that trying to make nicey-nice with them is sort of beside the point. I mean, they're people that have been pushed over the edge into desperation. So mind war is a way to reduce that kind of thing, uh, which you can do, as I said, by what, what amounts to calming everybody down as much as possible through subliminal devices. But you still have a very large uphill slope to climb. And that is where one of the new mind war branches called metaphors uh, comes into play. And what I've done in the book is to replace, to supersede, if you will, the three special operations branches of the Army, which were psychological operations, special forces, and civil affairs, civil affairs with three new ones called mind war, which handles, again, the implementation of the various psychons, these uh, subliminal forces that we project into a given geographic area to people there, and metaphors, which is the revised special forces, which consists of ground, people on the ground, um, you might say boots on the ground again, but these are teams that go into a given situation with the specific mission of diffusing the antagonisms there. And they only go into a situation which has been pre-prepped by the mind war branch, which is essentially blanketed with all these psychons to maximize their chances of success. Once the metaphors branch has succeeded in stopping the active combat as best it can, then you bring in the third one, which is the revised civil affairs branch, and that's called parapolitics. And it is a nation-building consortium that basically looks at a particular political situation and looks for the optimal reconstruction of it to make everybody as happy as possible, and then builds that. And it is not, um, it, it's a little different from what we look at right now, because right now our various political systems around the world are tremendously ideological. We're divided into capitalism, we're divided into the remnants of communism or socialism uh, or, or visions of a sort of an economic warfare, such as you see going on right now in the EU with Greece and so on. Yes. And what parapolitics does is to essentially scrap all this ideological simplicity and say, to heck with this stuff. What we want to do is come up with the best possible cooperative arrangement and if it means that you have a giraffe running the country then we will you know find a giraffe but whatever it is we're not going to be driven by ideology we're simply going to be driven by humanitarian values and by peaceful construction values and once we get everybody kind of cooperating and working together then you can argue about you know marx or <laughs> or John Locke, or whoever you wish to, ideologically. But for right now, we just want to get people cooperating. We want to get people fed. We want to get economies back on their feet. We want to reduce misery and and establish an, a, an atmosphere of common cooperation. So there you have the machinery of mind war at its, um, I would say, its most basic in terms of the devices that we use and the and the bodies that we use to go about implementing it. 
And, and this is exactly what every nation and humankind, for that matter, should strive for, to uh, A, have a good economy where everyone's in work and not necessarily have an economy driven by warfare. And more importantly, we need to stop the violence and end the suffering. And, and I love one of the things that I guess it will come to shortly is the use of, as we mentioned earlier, the, the subconsciousness and subliminal programming as well as uh, propaganda, which will, some people say it's a bad thing, but they use propaganda regularly and subliminal pro programming regularly for instance uh, uh, there was a law which I, I think you might know of that was passed in 74 that I think around that era to end a movie theater a subliminal programming because what they would do is they would flash images of coca-cola and uh, a popcorn briefly throughout the, the movies to basically entice you to go out and buy the popcorn and the soda from the front. I don't think these have ended. I personally, they very well might have. But again, this just goes to the human mind, as you mentioned. Uh, what is the next step from that point? Well, Propaganda, as most people understand it, takes place at the conscious level. This is, these are arguments that you get. This is what you hear on your news broadcasts that tell you that certain groups or people are good or bad or certain policies are good or bad. They're trying to argue you into supporting or endorsing a particular line. But propaganda normally doesn't take place at the subliminal level because, again, this is your pattern thinking. This is your level of reality. And... The only way that um, I would say commercial messages like Coca-Cola and potato chips are going to enter your pattern thinking are just over a long period of time in which you grow up in a world in which you begin to think of Coca-Cola as a particularly refreshing drink. And it sort of, you don't really think about it consciously, but you say, gee, this is a hot day. I think I feel like having a Coke. Yes. So it isn't so much that you've been argued into it by somebody who says, I think you ought to have a Coke or let's go get a Coke, but just that you automatically associate something like Coca-Cola with a cool, fizzy drink on a hot day. And that's just something that is the result of Coca-Cola being around for a long time. In fact, so long that people forget that its name originally came from the fact that it had some cocaine in it. Cocaine. That's right. <laughs> Which is why it probably <laughs> tasted so good. <laughs> but in any case, that's propaganda. And actually, um, our use of, of propaganda, for example, in the Army, in PSYOP, has, has been at the very superficial level, at the very surface level, a little bit like you see with the World War II propaganda, and the, and um, particularly in World War I, I would say, was when it really exploded, and there was a lot of, of uh, you know, scenes showing the Kaiser butchering Belgian nuns and things like this. So, um, what we're looking at here, in, again, in, in Mind War is not so much dealing with propaganda, because that's pretty transitory, and that is what we're trying to do. Rather, we're trying to, as I said, get at the electrochemical bases of human attitudes that dispose you in a certain way. Take the example for of, um, like, brain waves. Okay. People are generally familiar with the four basic kinds of brain waves. You have alpha, you have beta, you have theta, and you have delta. And the, the differences of these waves, of course, take place at um, different dispositions in your head. So alpha waves are where your head is at when you are in a relaxed, positive, and friendly state of mind. A good example, for example, is when you are watching TV. <laughs> yes. uh, or if you're just relaxed and in a pleasant mood. Beta are the waves that your brain is in when you are actively and aggressively thinking or working on a problem. That's when you are most mentally active, but it's also when you're the most nervous and the most brittle. 